Okay, this video is Poor Man's Way to Fight Cancer, and this is the book. Just for clarification, I previously gave a lecture by the same name, and actually somebody said, hey, why don't you make that into a book? So I'm like, okay, I'll make it into a book. And that's why, the, so, but this is not the lecture, this is the book. Uh, it was published in July 2023, um, and I'll start out, also I'm just going to give commentary on it. Why did I start out with the Ten Commandments of Nutrition right in the beginning? Because most books have all this filler nonsense, waste of time information in the beginning, and usually, you know, a good writer gets to the point. Something useful right from the beginning. The sooner the better. Uh, so I try to do that with my books. Put something good right at the beginning. Okay, um, so it says, You are fat and sick because you eat the wrong food and you rub toxins on yourself. It's your fault, but that's good because it means you can fix it. Yeah, you want everything to be your fault because you can fix yourself. I mean, in this sense. Okay, subtitle of it is Cancer Picture Book because there's about 110 illustrations. I did it in color, which is a little more expensive, but the color adds a lot of things in the drawings. Okay, in the name of the starch, the fruit, and the vegetable, let us pray. The Ten Commandments of Nutrition are written in stone. Follow them and you will be born again into better body weight and better health. Starch is the true God of food. Thou shalt put no other foods before starch. Starch includes potatoes, sweet potatoes, rice, beans, oatmeal, quinoa, millet, carrots, Eat starch to satisfy hunger and to provide energy. It's the best way to satisfy hunger. Starch is the way. Starch is the entree. So instead of a meat or whatever entree, you got starch. Starch should be about 60 to 90% of your calories in general for most people. And again, remember this is written for cancer patients. You could, you could eat more fruit, but there's complexities to fruit. You know, it's more expensive, doesn't store as well, and now there's a whole APL issue. Okay. Commandment number two, thine brain is a thermostat. Hypothalamic hunger center forces you to eat exactly the amount of food that you do. The hunger drive, the hunger is set by the almighty hunger drive and it will crush any willpower attempts to change. Eat less and exercise more is the mantra of chumps. It doesn't work. People who try to eat less and exercise more, they, they have problems. You have to change what you eat. The thermostat can only be reset by changing what you eat. And you don't need to count calories. Just eat the right foods and the body will correct itself. Commandment number three, vegetables are the best source of nutrients. Fruits are good in limited amounts. If thou art young and skinny or if thou exercisest much, then thou may eateth more fruit. For every meal, thou must ask thyself three questions. What starch, what vegetable, what fruit? And, and by the way, I like fruits a little more than I'm saying here. There's reasons why I'm doing this, what I'll get to later. But okay, so now I've got to advance the page here. Plants provide what you need to spread your seed. Plants, foods, optimize your sex appeal. Vegetables vasodilate by increasing nitric oxide, potassium, and magnesium. So that's where the, all, all the stuff comes from plants. The nitrate precursors to make nitric oxide vasodilate are systemic throughout your body, you know, process through the back of your tongue and your stomach. Potassium is big in plants, so is magnesium. This is what you want. The opposite of meat and processed food that's high in sodium. Better blood flow gives you the glow of vitality. Yeah, vegans look younger. That's one of the big reasons why. It's not a diet. It's a way of life. You don't just do this for a month. You do it every day the rest of your life. Commandment number six, thou shalt not eat meat. Meat makes you fat. Milk is liquid meat. Cheese is meat jello. When you eat cheese, you look like the animal at it, where it came from. Uh, pizza looks the same on your plate and your arteries. That's what atherosclerotic plaques look like, a cheese pizza, um, like atherosclerotic plaques. Meat causes leaky gut. Xenocyelitis, you know, foreign inflammation um, due to the new 5AC. Okay, inflammation, autoimmune disease, the sialic acids on the glycocalyx. Meat causes constipation, abdominal pressure syndrome. Meat causes iron overload, estrogen overload, and tumor promotion. Yeah, a lot of people say, oh, isn't meat macho? No, meat is, is an estrogenic thing, the net result of it causing estrogen overload. Okay, thou shalt not eat oils. Oils are liquid fat and they make you fat. Oils are tumor promoters. If you must go to a restaurant, then choose the buffet and eat your salad without dressing. Skip the dressing and you will look better undressed. Salad dressing is for pussies. Sodium is for dummies. It causes hypertension. Okay, you don't need these things. Once you get not used to not having them, you'll be glad you don't. Okay, thou shalt not commit adultery with junk food and fast food. Commandment number nine, thou shalt not bear false witness against the vegan diet. There are two kingdoms of food. The vegan kingdom is the land of the healthy aging like the Tarahumara, the Okinawa, and the Yanomamo, the rural Kenya, Sardinia, and Loma Linda. 
The meat junk food kingdom is the land of the fat and the sick like the Pima and most Americans. You may ask, what about the fat vegans? They have fallen into temptation of oils and sweets, the siren song of philosophic vegans. Do not be fooled by those false prophets. The path to optimal health is by orthodox veganism. Low sodium, low fat, whole food, 100% organic, 100% vegan, starch based, with no oil, caffeine, alcohol, or sweets. Does that sound like too much effort? Get the an attitude of gratitude. Heal your objections to veganism and it may heal you. When the rest of your age cohort is fat, diabetic, woodless, hooked on hypertension pills, mentally slow, and worried about open heart surgery, you'll be waking up with the wood and the only question will be whether to bop the bishop or bang the baddie. Starch has saved you. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's plate of GMO-fed, hormonally hypertrophied, antibiotic-assaulted, hexane-extracted, MSG-marinated, trans-fat fried Frankenstein food. Welcome to health purgatory. Restore hope, all ye who enter. In middle age, I found myself in a dark wood, and the path was lost. Dante from the Divine Comedy. So the joke there is, you know, in Dante and Divine Comedy says, abandon hope, all ye who enter. So that's great about vegan. You know, you're heading into, you know, middle age and elderly years, and instead of always being a downhill slide with vegan, you can stabilize things a lot often improve. Okay, you can make it to health paradise. The theme song is winners eat starch and fruits for six-pack abs and a horn that toots. Thesis, become a vegan again or you're effed for health. Uh, plant eaters are healthier because that's what we're made to eat. Premium fuel for premium performance. Everything in the body runs better with good blood flow and good nutrients. The motto, vegan today, vegan tomorrow, vegan forever. Okay, and I got that from Augustus Welby Pugin. He was the great architect of the Victorian Renaissance and Catholic architecture, designing all the cathedrals. And he said, Gothic today, Gothic tomorrow, Gothic forever. Okay, so here's a table of contents. You know, I always start out with an intro. I call it the bore word. And I'll make a lot of jokes, just stuff that, you know, I know a lot of people aren't going to want or be able to get through the molecular biology, the biochemistry stuff. So I'll put a couple of jokes up front. Um, then I'll go through the cancer. And so you can see for yourself what's up with the estrogenics. I go through a lot of what causes cancer and what can you do about it. That's the main point of the whole book. Okay, now here's this joke of a dedication. Where does this come from? It comes from Ruskin, John Ruskin. He was one of the leaders of the great Renaissance Christian movements in Victorian England with regard to architecture, painting, um, and he loved the cathedrals. And he's the one who promoted the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood of Magnificent Artists. His speech is available on YouTube, the 1853 speech. It's magnificent. So anyways, his wife was Effie, and they had a kind of a crazy relationship. But just her name, Effie, was kind of funny to me. And so I made this dedication to my dear wife, Effie. Effie, I love. You are the mother effer of our children. Sometimes I do wish you would F off. Okay, so it's silly, but I don't know. It seemed funny to me at the time. Disclaimer, I have nothing to declare but my genius. Oscar Wilde. Okay, then the, the real disclaimer, the book is for educational purposes only. It is not medical advice. I'm not your doctor. I'm just a lonely old autistic hermit who writes these books because I have nothing else to do. Dietary change can have a powerful effect on blood pressure and blood glucose. If you are taking any medications, you should let your doctor know before changing your diet as this will likely lead to medication changes. Okay, now we're in the bore word. Okay, for the foreword, and basically the point of it is most people are just sick and pathetic, um, eating the sad diet, the paleo diet, some version of this. And they have, they have all the Western diseases. All these diseases go together. It's the same cause, the bad diet, plus the toxins in the bad diet. And you know the routine. CAD, coronary artery disease, hypertension, diabetes, etc. Okay, then there's this other group, and I call it, so they're totally screwed. They're just screwed. They never get better. They just crash and burn. And all their money's taken away from them as they rapidly head towards an early death. Okay, and that's like the most common American, how they age. All right, half-screwed is somebody who's like, and a lot of doctors are in this category. They're sort of lacto, ovo, pesco, vegetarians. And I got a lot of friends in this category. And they'll come to me, and you know they'll see their health going down, and they'll talk to me. And I think it's funny, because I have, I have lots of you know doctors in other fields, and I'm giving them advice in their field, because they know I know. They know their own books are wrong and out of date and they know I've read the paper so they talk to me which I think is funny I like you know I, I take it as a compliment when they ask my opinion um, but the point I'm saying is lacto ovo pesco stuff flexitarian stuff it's bogus it plugs up arteries 
Um, it's almost like a, an improved version of the Mediterranean diet, but it's still got the Mediterranean diet mentality. It's basically high fat and it's high animal protein. It's very few people. It's, it's really 1% or maybe less that are really optimizing their health from what I've seen. Okay, so this is a normal distribution. Um, let's see, what's new in this book? Okay, like why did I make this book? Well, I had a little bit of extra time more than I usually do for the month. Um, and I had gotten used to working with this color drawing program that I had never had before and I wrote my earlier books. They don't have color illustrations. So that's why I wanted to make it because it's so much easier to learn from a colored picture. What I would suggest if you're interested in learning about what's known about preventing cancer is, um, you know, get the book or just watch my videos on it. And you can watch uh, the videos also of other persons like, you know, McDougal. I think McDougal and I are real complimentary. He kind of had knows all the literature from the 1900s and he's good on the epidemiology and has a lot of clinical experience. I go into a lot more details about the biochemistry, the molecular biology, the pathophysiology, and I got the whole radiology, surgical background. But I think the two end up being real complimentary. T. Colin Campbell, he's like the world's expert on protein. And then it's great to hear from also persons with personal experience. Ruth Heydrich, you know, she reversed her, um, what was thought to be a fatal uh, breast cancer. She's alive over 40 years later. Okay. It's nice to have a book and to read all this stuff and watch the videos because then you can just write what you learn from the video in your notes. Okay, you can do a lot to reduce your risk of cancer, some of the key points in the whole book. Um, a lot that the individual can do improves long-term survival. This never gets into standard of care because lots of the patients, you have to remember, see patients who watch these videos think they're like regular patients or not. Regular patients in most hospitals in America and probably most countries too, they're usually functionally illiterate you know they don't read books and many of them have been heavily cigarette smokers alcoholics drug addicts cognitively impaired you know really elderly so they're not going to do as much to help themselves but a person who's with it they can do a tremendous amount the somatic mutation theory that cancer is primarily caused by dna damage and mutations has largely been refuted the metabolic theory of cancer like the warburg theory of cancer has a tremendous amount of data to support it, and it tells you what to do to lower your risk. It's very useful. It's the one that I think is correct. Um, I also mentioned here that my videos are mostly here at YouTube, but I also put some at BitChute and Rumble and Twitter and LinkedIn. And if I ever get the boot from this uh, video channel, I will put all my stuff at those other sites. But in general, I prefer YouTube just because it's got better software. It's got a bigger audience. There's a lot of benefits to it. Okay, um, in his book, Mystery Method by Mystery, about seducing women, he described the average guy as an AFC, meaning average frustrated chump. In this book, I will describe the average person as an ADS, an average dumb shit. And we will call the wise person a WP. Okay, you'll say, well, why do I do that? Well, I'm trying to help people. And, and you know, you got to learn to make smart decisions. I can tell you the vast majority of people, in my experience as a doctor, I've been a doctor over 30 years, they just do stupid stuff and they have crappy outcomes, okay? Like as soon as you see a person on chemotherapy, the typical knee-jerk thing to do is to say, oh, this poor person, it's so sad. Good luck. I hope they have a good outcome. And yeah, sure, you wish them the best, okay? But what I can tell you is there's a lot of patients who go for um, – chemo who really don't need it. They're taking chemo when they would have been better off not taking it because they were too lazy to learn about it. And there's sort of an attitude, well, the person's already, we know they're going to die. We'll just give chemo a try. But, you know, there's reasons to do things and not do things. If you just get chemo and it's not likely to benefit, you still get the side effects, okay? So here's a quote from Chris Wark, long-term survivor of colon cancer and author of the book, Chris B. Cancer. He says, to just go for surgery and chemo is easy. You just sign the consent form. That's passive. To study cancer and completely change your diet, your exercise, your habits, your attitude towards life, that's difficult. That takes a lot of effort. That's an active process instead of a passive, passive process, signing the chemo consent form. So I do like Chris work, and I think he's done some good things. Um, he's especially good on the psychology of recovering from cancer. I disagree with his advice on olive oil. I recommend to avoid all oils. I think it's just highly processed liquid fat. Okay. Um, let me uh, go to the next slide here and see if I my program is the way it should be here. What's going on here?
Got to adjust the slide one sec here. Okay, um, the typical ADS, average dumb shit, is all emotional when they get cancer. Oh my God, I've got cancer. I'm going to fight this thing. Doctor, doctor, please get it on my body. Cut it out. Cut it out. I want surgery. That's very stupid. Okay, the cancer has probably been sitting there for years, if not decades. And to just rush to surgery without knowing if you need surgery, that's not smart. And to just agree to chemo without figuring out what is the likelihood it will increase my five-year survival, my 10-year survival. It's very smart to do that. And I can tell you, hardly anyone does. These are famous last words of people who end up with problems and disappointing outcomes. Just cut it out. Just cut it out. Yeah, I'll take the chemo. No, you have to think about it. What is the risk-benefit ratio? The wise person knows that cancer has probably been there at least a decade. They know they got some time to study. Cancer only works well for a few types of cancers. Leukemias, lymphomas, acicular cancer, small cell lung cancer, and a couple other ones. But it often does not work for many of the most common cancers. So, you know, unless chemo was going to provide a big benefit, like it's shown to produce more than 30% increased five-year survival or 10-year survival or something, then me personally, I wouldn't do it because it's guaranteed to give you unpleasant effects. Whereas most people just sign up for it. They have no idea what the likelihood of uh, improvement in survival is going to be. Just because it shrinks the size of the tumor, that doesn't mean you're going to survive longer. There could be stem cells underneath the shrinkage of the daughter cells, and they're just going to come back. Okay. Um, so like I said, in the past, whenever I saw a chemo patient with a bald head, I immediately feel sorry for them. And I still do. But now I say to myself, they're often just an ADS who didn't really read about their disease. And, you know, it's... Life's rough if you're smart and you're careful. If you're stupid and you're lazy, it's a lot worse. Okay, as far as the format of this book and my lectures, I usually start out with basic useful information. And then I'll add some things that are a little more technical uh, that I hope are interesting. Uh, so this would be a general understanding. This would be a little more uh, technical points. And then I'll throw in a couple more advanced stuff. Um, and real so almost specialized things. And then I joke that these are AOs. They'll take you to an AO academic orgasm. But then I'll come right back down to some just common sense, basic stuff. But uh, So I think that makes the book interesting for people who are experts. You could, you could have experts who did their life work in cancer and they'll find tons of new stuff in this book versus and so for somebody who doesn't know anything about science or something there'll be times when it gets over their head a little bit but it'll come right back to common sense okay so i call this the multiple ao academic orgasm approach to public speaking and writing i promise to go slow and be gentle the useful information okay like i just said here um i usually only put one illustration per page in the book just because the word processing program has a hard time handling the illustrations or it's kind of fussy um and it's almost like uh, dealing with a crazy girlfriend if you don't limit it to one illustration per page most of the time. Okay, so what's rule number one in preventing cancer? No meat. Meat increases cancer risk in over 30 ways. Um, and when I say preventing cancer, most of the time things that prevent cancer also help to slow cancer growth. There's no guarantees of anything, but you, this is how you get your odds as good as possible. The same things that prevent cancer almost always potentially help to slow it. Um, I have to speak a little euphemistically about all this because Big Pharma won't allow a doctor to uh, talk too praiseworthy about the plants and uh, lifestyle, diet and lifestyle type stuff. But you can read for yourself and it'll all make sense here. And everything in here, I do it already. Uh, that's one reason why I don't screen for cancer because I'm already doing everything I can to minimize my risk. Um, I live the anti-cancer lifestyle to the max. I'm proud of the fact that I'm aging better than all the people I know at my own age. I'm 59 and especially more than my wife. Um, and I joke about my wife. I mean, men joke about their wives. Every time I talk to guys about conversations, you know, men always joke about their wives. There's a weird thing in society. You know, I get all these like brainwashed liberals. It's like, oh, you made a joke about your wife. Yeah, no shit. I mean, guys joke about that. What am I supposed to do? I mean, she gets all my money. All I get to do is make a couple jokes once in a while. Believe me, she has a better deal than I do. I wish I was married to myself. <laughs> I'd be a lot wealthier. Um, let's see, what else here? 
uh, in our younger days, we once went to a party and my wife said to me, do you know what people think when they see us? I could tell she was up to no good, but I played along. What? She said, what is such a beautiful woman doing with such an ugly man? I said, I thought they were thinking, what is such a smart man doing with such a stupid woman? Now that I'm the better looking one, I could have taken advantage of the situation by sleeping with her friends, but I didn't because I don't want to ruin those friendships for her. And she likes to visit them and it gets her out of the house. So I get some peace and quiet. Okay. And I'm just joking, okay? I can joke, all right? I'm getting bent out of shape. There's also this idea in modern society, oh, toxic masculinity, toxic masculinity. That's like a Marxist psyop just to feminize everybody, make them into a bunch of wimp sissies so that they will allow slavery to be imposed upon them, modern communism, okay? So, you know, that's how men are. We've always been this way. We joke about our wives, you know, and then that'll be your... your the guys who protect you, okay? I'm an old man now, but I can tell you, I knew the young guys when I was young. And they were all macho guys. That's sort of normal for a young guy. This modern stuff is all new. We're not going to talk about that too much here, but this is all new, this idea that men and women are so similar. They did not, they're not, number one, for real. And it was more widely acknowledged that they were not in the past. Okay, here's a graph of cancer and um, Western diseases versus dietary animal protein. And the idea for this graph comes from the work of T. Colin Campbell and his book, like the China Study, as well as his lecture. But basically, here it is. The more animal protein a person eats, the more cancer they get. And so you look in the westernized countries that eat a lot of meat. They got tons and tons of cancer. You go to some of these eastern countries where they eat mostly rice, fruits, and vegetables, they got hardly any cancer. And then what was initially a little confusing about it is it correlates with animal protein. It correlates with saturated fat. But saturated fat is really like a marker for animal protein because saturated fat mostly comes from meat. Um, it correlates with dietary cholesterol. But why is that? Because dietary cholesterol is increased by both animal protein, the leucine and methionine inducing an anabolic uh, phase in the blood, as well as by the high saturated fat. <laughs> okay. Um, and it's also you can correlate it with IGF level, insulin-like growth factor, or you can correlate it with high insulin level, meaning insulin resistance, because they all go together. They're all the same thing. Animal protein with its amino acid composition being different than plants, there's more leucine and methionine. It causes this anabolic phase that raises blood cholesterol. It says to the body, time to build. We got excess nutrition, overnutrition available. Okay, so that's why they all go together. And, you know, T. Colin Campbell would say, oh, the animal protein is the worst part of it. Um, let's see. Animal food does not have any carbohydrate except for milk. Animal food has zero fiber. Um, all animal cells stabilize their external plasma cell membrane with cholesterol. That's how they, they make it more rigid. And plants do something quite different. They have a cell wall made out of fiber on it. So you always get fiber from plants. You always get more cholesterol from, from animal food. And not to mention, like we just said, the high sat fat and animal protein amino acid composition drive up your blood cholesterol. Okay, all mammal cells stabilize their cholesterol membranes. Animal protein is an anabolic effect. Elevated blood cholesterol causes atherosclerosis. Elevated LDL cholesterol in the blood makes the RBC stick together. Animal protein causes activation of mTOR. mTOR is mammalian target rapamycin, also called uh, mechanistic tar target rapamycin, and it's a, like a contractor getting ready to build a building. It needs all its building materials available. And this is a real key step. This is one of the most important things you can know about cancer is when mTOR has all its building materials available, like a building contractor, it says build, which in this context is the cell replicate itself. A cell has to double its contents before it's able to replicate. So what you want to do is deprive the cell. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a moment, but deprive it of what it needs to replicate. So it can't double itself and then it can't grow. Okay, animal protein is more leucine and methionine. That's often the rate limiting step for activation of mTOR is those amino acids, leucine and methionine, which are much more common in animal protein than in plant protein. So that's why animal protein causes activation of mTOR. That's one of the main reasons. The prevention of mTOR activation strategies like the Fabian strategy. So what was happening when the Romans were fighting uh, Carthage in the Punic Wars is that Hannibal, the general leading Carthage, was just kicking their butts. Um, the, the Romans simply could not face him head to head or he would always crush them. He killed many tens of thousands of Romans. And then they've had to find somebody in Rome who could protect them from Hannibal because Carthage was going to take over the city of Rome. And Fabius Quintus Maximus stepped forward and he had a strategy to defeat Hannibal. Hannibal, when he was in Italy, was far from 
far from his home base. And so he had weak supply lines. So Fabius just tried to destroy his supply lines and avoid a head-on-head -head confrontation. And he was able to eventually defeat Hannibal. And that's essentially what would do to cancer. Okay. Okay, here's another graph idea from T. Colin Campbell's uh, research. Uh, cancer deaths, or actually, I don't know if this one's from T. Colin Campbell. It might be. I don't, I'm not sure about that. But cancer deaths over time. Red is the men. I don't, actually don't think this one's T. Colin Campbell, but I got one more graph I think that I got learned from his research. Cancer deaths over time. Um, you'll hear about the so-called war on cancer, all this BS. There's barely been a dent in cancer survival. Now, people are going to tell you, oh, cancer survival is improving. Mm, not really. What you got is a lot more patients are diagnosed early from early screening mechanisms. So if you look at them, you got what's called a lead length bias, whereby you diagnose them earlier in their course, but is their actual course of how long they were going to live anyways changing? Not much. I mean, there's a few cancers that respond well to treatment and benefit significantly, but overall, it's not much. Um, cancer is still treated the same way as when I was a, a young guy. Lots and lots of chemo. Lots and lots of surgery, occasional radiation. And don't get me wrong, in some contexts, that can be helpful. But what I'm trying to say is, it's really kind of simple-minded. And uh, there's next to zero discussion of um, the effect of diet and lifestyle uh, on the individual. And for example, there was that guy out of Harvard... You know, Suresh Mukherjee, real bright guy, you know, world scholar, and he wrote his book, and he like had less than a paragraph. Uh, he wrote this, The Emperor of All Maladies, Cancer, you know, and he, he had less than a paragraph on nutrition, which is a joke, okay? And that's what I'm saying. Here's a guy who trained at Harvard, world scholar, and he's an oncologist, and he doesn't know anything about nutrition or toxicology. That's stupid, okay? <laughs> that's pathetic. That's what I meant by Harvard University has become a joke, okay? Um, and conventional medicine, to some extent, has become a joke when it comes to chronic disease, okay? If most disease is caused by diet and toxins, and you don't know anything about diet and toxins, how much do you really know about most diseases? You don't know much, okay? Um, uh, and, of course, it's chemo super profitable, and that's been one of the reasons why. Let's say you work at an Ivy League university. You have to make the chemo company happy, or you don't get grant money. And if you don't get grant money to get you know published papers, then you don't get promoted or you get fired. So the system is designed so that it cannot fix itself. And that's why you've heard me talk before about religion. And the truth is the transition towards more and more of an atheistic viewpoint in American society has led to a severe deterioration of the quality of health care. And it's only going to get worse because... If you have a God-based worldview such that you value the individual, you know, the most important minority is the individual, then you want to do the right thing by them. On the other hand, if you don't have that, if you have the atheistic Darwinist viewpoint that the individual is just a talking primate, what obligation do you have to a talking primate? Talking primates are in zoos, okay? You have to stay with the money, okay? And who's got the money? The drug companies, the insurance companies, the big hospitals, and, you know, the patient's got nothing. The patient has no money. All they can do is say thank you. Okay, so you, you have to care about them. Okay, and everybody says they care about them, but when push comes to shove, medicine's based on what does the device company want, what does the drug company want, what does the insurance company want, okay? Um, let's see. Chemo companies and hospitals, they know they're going to get their money whether the patient lives or dies, okay? As a matter of fact, what happens to the patient in healthcare is for the most part irrelevant. I know that's a bizarre thing to say, but what I'm saying is a doctor gets paid if he provides a service, you know, and a billing code. Whether or not the patient lives or dies doesn't change whether or not that code is billed and they get paid. Um, so, you know, the patient says, I'm going to go to the hospital and try to get cured, but that's not kind of like how it works. They receive services. They have a certain blood test, a certain imaging test. They're prescribed a certain medication. Their insurance company pays for those things. There's no increase in payment for curing the patient. As a matter of fact, there's a dramatic drop in payment if the patient's cured, because then they then they can walk away and don't need anything else if they're actually fully cured. Okay. Um, I also made the point: high functioning people can do a lot to help themselves, but they're they're relatively un uncommon, and so that's why everything's based on standard of care for people who cannot help themselves at all. They simply take their pill or have their surgery. 
but that's why you know a high functioning person will say, "Isn't there anything more?" And the system quite often will have no answer for them, and they have to read on their own to figure these things out. Um, learn about nutrition, toxicology, stress management, you know, etc. The ADS patients they cannot do this. They don't have the intellectual curiosity or literacy to learn that much. Um, and I will say this: I know lots of doctors that will never read a book. So somebody who you know has not pursued education after the high school level or didn't seriously pursue it at the college level, you think they're going to read a book? They don't. I've been amazed. I have lots and lots of friends with graduate degrees who don't ever read a book. They never read a book. And they all say the same thing, I'm too busy. That's why I show you, you know, you can just read in your bathroom and listen to an audio book in your car and you'll get through at least two books a week. Okay, um, it does require a lot of study on one's own to learn all this stuff. You can learn from watching videos. You don't have to read. Um, and I can tell you, man, the number of people cognitively impaired is, is, is off the charts. Uh, one of my internal medicine friends told me that almost all of her patients over 60 are cognitively impaired. And I have other internal medicine friends tell me most of their patients over 50 are mentally slow. Uh, my psychiatrist friend told me that most of his psychiatry patients didn't just have psychiatric diseases. They were also stupid most of the time. Um, in my experience of talking to a lot of patients, you know, a lot of them are very nice. A lot of these older patients, I'm just saying over 60, they're very pleasant. You know, they're nice. They're likable. I like them. But they're mentally slow. They're kind of cow-like. Yes, thank you, yes. And I think it's for all the numerous reasons. There's lots of things causing cognitive impairment, and that's been a subject of plenty of other lectures. Um, and so, so well, the, the whole point of this is that somebody who actually looks at their disease and studies it, they can do much, much better than average. All right, so here's the number of cancer foci in rodents in comparison with the percent of calories calories from animal protein. This also comes from the research of T. Colin Campbell. So basically, the more animal person animal protein a person eats, the more cancer they get. And what's scary about it is there is no bottom threshold. Uh, any animal protein increases cancer risk. So that's part of the reason why he recommends zero animal protein. I agree with that. I think that Americans eat way too much protein. I actually think they eat too much plant protein too. Okay, um, let's see. TCC says Americans were eating about 15% protein. I think they're eating more than that. And he says that a lot of it is animal protein. I think the guy deserves a Nobel Prize. They'll never give T. Colin Campbell a Nobel Prize. None of these nutrition uh, superstars of research will ever get a Nobel Prize. The reason is Nobel Prize generates publicity. They don't want these guys to get publicity. They don't want the public to know, you know that they can often cure themselves with diet and lifestyle. That would be bad for business. Okay. TCC, that's T. Colin Campbell, he showed that the more animal protein the rodents got, the more cancer they got. He even showed that if he stopped all the animal protein, the cancers routinely would stop growing. That's an important point. Remove the animal protein from the diet and the cancer stopped growing in his rodent study. That's one of the reasons why people are confident that they got a very good chance to slow the growth of their cancer by stopping the animal protein in their diets. Um, he did his experience in numerous different ways. I read, I read all of his books, they're quite good. And um, no matter what they did, Animal protein was the major cause of cancer. He especially thought casein from milk was really bad. TCC was so confident of his research that when his wife was diagnosed with melanoma, he put her on you know the same vegan diet, and she did great. Alive years later, TCC says there's no safe lower level of animal protein. It's best to not eat any at all. Uh, TCC says that animal protein is the most important cause of cancer. Um, so it's, a, it's, it's an important tumor promoter. Think of it as a major tumor promoter. So to summarize uh, what we covered so far here is, uh, wise persons know the best diet has zero animal protein, no meat, not one bite, and that includes dairy, no milk, not one drop. Same goes for any dairy product, dairy product like cheese or yogurt. I would never eat those foods. And here's basically, you know, these are the basic choices in life. I'm telling you, I've been a doctor 30 years, and this is what I see all day long, every day. The average chump, average ADS, average dumb shit, they eat all the meat, oil, processed foods, and get them exposed to all the toxins and all these personal care products, etc. end up on a whole bunch of drugs, and then they start getting operated on, chop, 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 and then bye-bye money, dead early, all right? Smart move is like we just talked about, be self-sufficient. Get the diet fixed. That's the most important thing. Then also, you know, get your exercise, your sleep, etc. You've got a very good chance to live to 90 or older. Um, the ADS types, you know, eating the sad diet, they're sick by their 30s or 40s. They're usually fat by then, hypertensive, pre-diabetic. Um, 
And you know, pills sometimes slow it down a little bit, but not that much for most of these things. Um, William C. Roberts, if you feed a herbivore a high fat diet, they all develop atherosclerosis 100%. Yeah, and that's what happens. All of these patients, they all got atherosclerosis. I can tell you, looking at the charts, if you told me that an American patient was 60 years old, um, you know, instead of typical American patient, I would automatically know that meant coronary artery disease, that meant diabetes, that meant overweight, that meant hypertensive, and probably a whole bunch of these other things, kidney stones, gastroesophageal reflux, uh, impotence. Okay, humans are herbivores. If you feed them a high-fat diet, they all get atherosclerosis. Atherosclerosis blocks arteries, and then that'll decrease oxygen delivery to the tissues. Lack of oxygen delivery is called hypoxia. Mild hypoxia tends to cause cellular dysfunction. When it's more severe, a lot of cells will die. That's called necrosis. If it's sort of an intermediate amount, then they get apoptosis. So necrosis is sudden death, all right? Apoptosis means they're not getting enough oxygen relative to the metabolic rate, and then they just gradually die. That's a very common thing in people's brains. Normal apoptosis is a slow death where the cell can recycle itself, so its chemical constituents are reused by other cells. Cancer is really a normal cell that is hypoxic by the Warburg effect, and that causes it to transform into an anaerobic bacteria, to be very much like an anaerobic bacteria. And this is called the Warburg effect. Uh, Otto Warburg from Germany, he won the Nobel Prize in biochemistry in 1931. And this is called the Warburg effect. It's one of the keys to understanding cancer. So the graph kind of all comes down to this. Basically, you eat the American diet, the SAD diet, standard American diet, and you end up with you know lots of sad fat, moderate amount of oil, moderate amount of sodium. And they end up with lots of diabetes, hypertension, heart attacks, impotence, cancer. That's all the classic Western diseases. You look at the East Asians, things like Japan, Korea, China, the rice, predominantly rice diet. Uh, rice is only 1% fat. Because it's so low in fat and they eat a lot of vet fruits and vegetables, that compensates for the fact that the sodium's off the chart, often 12 grams a day or more. Normal is only 200 milligrams a day. And... Um, they often smoke cigarettes. So because of that, they get a lot of atherosclerosis intracranial. That's the Asian pattern of atherosclerosis, intracranial atherosclerosis associated with a lot of strokes because uh, they got all this hypertension. South Asians like India, their problem is they tend to eat lots of fried foods. And the fried foods, they get some sat fat also from the dairy, the ghee and whatnot. But that really increases the risk dramatically of diabetes and as well as a lot of these Western type diseases, hypertension, myocardial infarction, impotence. So that's a big mistake in their diet. And who wins the game? Low fat, low sodium vegan, as usual. They're very low in their risk of diabetes, hypertension, myocardial infarction, heart attack, uh, stroke. So that's how you win the game of health. Okay, and the standard American diet is how you lose the game of health, like we showed. Um, this vegan diet, so, you know, it's about as good as you're going to do. It's like winning the lottery. You get all, the, all your ducks in a row. It's as good as a deal as you're going to get in health. Okay, now it was the part where I talk about my coaches. I think I'm going to make that part two. So we'll stop right here. So this was just part one of the, the book.